being today, we, we've been talking a lot about different things, and I've been reading your comments. So I've been looking at ways that we can, things that we can talk about on here as we go through Bible study. So today I want to talk a little bit about faith. And uh, we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 11 today. And the author of Hebrews, we don't know who that is because of the fact that there's, they, they have some, people have made some guesses over the years about who the author of Hebrews is, but um, the author built on the danger of unbelief throughout the first 10 chapters of Hebrews. And now we're going to come to Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to talk about faith. You know, because why is Jesus better than Moses, Joshua, or the other Old Testament people? And how should we be fearful of the unbelief? You know, because that will cause eternal unrest in the future. So Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 says, Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses... Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race that's marked out for us. So some people believe that their family is looking down on them because of this verse. They're seeing that everyone is eyeballing us from heaven, but nowhere in scripture does it say that people are watching us from heaven. You know, my family loves me. And some have gone home to be with Jesus. And I can't even imagine correctly what is front of, in front of their eyes right now and what they're looking at to see the amazing things that they're seeing. And, you know, I don't think they'll be looking back in our direction. Uh, one eye, eye surgeon actually uh, did a study on the book of Revelation. They said that if we looked at everything in heaven, we, it would burn our eyes out. It would actually the amazing colors and the amazing things that are taking place there. So we would have to have a transformation, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. Our, our bodies would have to be different. Our eyes would have to be different in order to see all those things around us. And the verses here say, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. So faith applies in relationship to the future and in relationship to the invisible. Faith is the foundation. The word in the Greek is what we stand under. Faith is the foundation of our hope. It's related to the future. You know, we believe that Jesus Christ will come with the sound of a trumpet with the voice of the archangel, and in the twinkling of an eye will be changed and will be caught up. The earth forever changed and a kingdom established. So, oh, oh my God, it's grandpa, yeehaw. So, no, I'm not a grandpa yet. I do have kids, um, still waiting to be a grandpa, but thank you for saying that. Yo little young man, whatever your name is, Flip Dizzle, young man, thank you for that. So, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 53 says, for the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. Because Adam walked with God in more than one dimension. Then the fall bound us to our existence as we're now in sin. Which Romans chapter 8 says, We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Creation is groaning. It's what it, it wants to be what it was once again. Because we did, you know, Adam and Eve lived in the first paradise. And then they fell. And then we have this now. We have this sinful, you know, life that we live and the stuff, that, the junk that we have to live in. So, you know, I guarantee if Jesus... No, I'm definitely not a woke liberal. <laughs> That's funny. I don't believe in any titles anyway, but whatever. Um, creation, thanks for the laugh, though. I appreciate that. Um, creation groaning to be what it was again. The joy. Um, and this is the awesome part about being a Christian is that we have the joy of knowing in the future we're going to hug our loved ones again. To see everyone again. 
to hug Jesus Christ. And, you know, the people on here that, that don't know Jesus, uh, the people who follow science, which are going to talk about science a little bit later, too, and why Christianity and science is a good thing as well. Um, but a lot of people will say that we're crazy to talk about that type of stuff. But here's the thing. What if, you know, here's the thing. We'll, we'll just say this. I believe that we believe, I believe I'm right. You believe you're right. You don't believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. So let's just say that you're right for a moment, even though I don't believe it. And we live, and you know, I live, and Christians live this life of hope and beauty. We live in what's to come, and our life is filled with joy. And what have we lost? What have we lost with our faith then? But here's the other thing. What if it's true? And then the, you don't believe it, and it's actually true. What are you going to lose? That's not a good thing. And that's why we Christians share the gospel with you, because of the fact we don't want you to experience what happens if you don't proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord. So, you know, people believe that all good people go to heaven, that they go to heaven. There's people who believe that they'll have a seat further back in heaven uh, because they weren't Jewish and they sit further back. Uh, some people believe that they'll gain their own planet for believing, um, or they'll, they believe that they're going to go somewhere else. But what if we're right? What if we are correct in what we're saying? What if Jesus was correct in saying that he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him? You know, Jesus was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. He said he's the only way to get to heaven. He died. He rose again. But when you don't believe that, that's what's the alternative? The alternative is not good. And we Christians don't want the alternative to happen to anybody. The place we go is thought out ahead of us with an infinite mind. God has an infinite mind. And when we get there, we'll be able to just let our minds go. And it will never reach its end. Every sensation beyond the speed of thought. The faith and reality of what we have not seen or thought yet. You know, Old Testament people were able to, um, to figure it out without the revelation that we have through Jesus Christ. So, you know, but... We tell these things to unsaved people like Flip Dizzle on here, who's saying that uh, we present as schiz you present as schizophrenia. So, um, and I've seen, you know, people do believe as Christians that what we believe is crazy because of the fact that they're looking with physical eyes and they're not looking with faith. And that's why we have to look with faith as believers. You know, the people on here who don't have Christ they're not standing in faith. And I see it on the comments weekly. Like I said, I see it right here right now. You know, I see it in the comments on TikTok weekly. You know, they come up with hundreds of arguments. The non-believers, they come out with hundreds of arguments about why Christianity is just a fairy tale. You know, they want to even debate and come on my live about it when they do not know something about me and something about other believers. You know, I've, I've spent years with Christians and with non-Christians alike. I actually believe debating with true believers is idiotic. So Christians debating with Christians. And I'm not talking about progressives, like those progressives that don't follow the Bible. That's a totally different thing. Progressive pastors are going to have a special place in judgment if they don't repent and stop leading people astray. I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about true believers who want to have $25 word debates like Calvinism versus Arminianism, the rapture, pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, or none, eschatology, preterist thinking, and other debates. When I've spent over 25 years of my life studying the Word of God, the primary doctrine of Jesus does not change for a Presbyterian, for a Lutheran, for a Methodist, for a Baptist, for non-denominational. The primary doctrine does not change, and we can all agree on that. 
But then we have to argue over other isms. So I think debating is silly when it comes to Christians debating Christians. You know, it's not what the members of the body actually need. But then there are those on TikTok Live that walk in darkness. Yet they want to debate with us about light. You know, they can come up with a hundred arguments in their minds about why God's not real. Then they go on live, my live and other people's lives. They troll other ones trying to get their debates and arguments in about why and hope that they can sway other people. The funny part is they're trying to sway other people walking in darkness, which isn't very hard to do. The Christians who are walking in light when they hear it, they walk by faith. So they're not going to be swayed. So that's the interesting part about that. So they go on live and they troll those places and try to do that because here's the thing, and it's in John chapter 3, verses 19 through 21. It says, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world. But people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that they have done what they have done has been done in the sight of God. That's John chapter 3 verses 19 through 21, which that's saying there, it's funny, it's saying that people love darkness. They say agape is the greatest love in the Bible. It's used to describe God. You know, he is agape love. But then the opposite takes place in this verse. Here it says people who are lost, people who are walking in darkness, they agape darkness. They want darkness. They enjoy sin. They enjoy being in a fallen state. Which I'm going to give you a disclaimer now. I enjoy mockers and atheists and people who don't believe in God coming on here. Because I once was a mocker. I once was an atheist. I once did not believe and I was walking in darkness. Then they hear the word, which is awesome because they hear the word of God, and then it shines like a light in their lives. It cuts into them. And eventually something is going to take place in their life. Especially if they come on here week by week. You know, Let them come on here week by week and hear the verse. And something's going to build up in them as they get the Bible and as they read the Bible. You know, I had a mocker on here a few weeks ago who wasn't a Christian. He reads the Bible every day. You know, I'm praying that that Bible will cut into him, that he will, the word of God is alive and active, it says, sharper than any double-edged sword. And I'm praying that it'll pierce into his heart and that he will see and know Jesus as Lord and Savior and that eventually what is going to take place is faith is going to grow. Because people who don't know Jesus can have hundreds of arguments, but without faith they have nothing. You know, which if they want to debate, which I have people always that well, let me come on your live. You know, there are plenty of pastors on here who will do that. You know, I watched one the other day. They go on there and they talk with people and they debate. But I truly believe prayer is stronger than any debate that I can give or that I can share or that anyone can. I, I want to pray for all these people on here that don't know Jesus, all the ones on here who are talking about things and saying things on here about dark, you know, dark things and darkness and stuff. I want to be able to pray for them, you know, plus God's word does something. Prayer does something. That's why I do weekly Bible study and prayer. That's why when people say, what are your opinions? Well, what's your opinion on this? What's your cultural situation and thought on this? You know, why do you care what I think? personally, because I tell them what the Bible says, what God's word and how God's word speaks to the matter, not my opinion. Whenever I do counseling, whenever I'm in my office and I give marriage counseling, I give biblical counseling. Whenever someone has an issue and they come in the office and they want to talk about it, 
I give them biblical counseling. I give them the Bible. I give them what the Bible says, not my opinion. You know, but people on here who don't know Jesus, they need faith. Atheists don't believe. Mockers do not have it. People cannot see, and they walk in darkness. And we need to pray for them to come out of the darkness and into the light because they agape it. They love the darkness. So I'm glad that you're here so that God's word can destroy those strongholds in your hearts and eventually shine light into you. I love that. So faith applies in relationship to the future and in relationship to the invisible. Faith is the foundation in the Greek of what we stand under. Faith is the foundation of our hope and it's related to the future. We believe that Christ will come with the sound of a trumpet, with the voice of the archangel and the twinkling of an eye, that we will be changed, that we'll be caught up, the earth forever changed, and a kingdom is going to be established because we are kingdom people. We serve a kingdom. I don't serve a religion. I don't serve a denomination. I don't serve under ma ma mammon or money or anything like that. Like these people come on here and they say, well, you care about money. I don't care less about diamonds or whatever you want to, you know, whatever is on here. Yahweh Jireh is our provider. He provides for me. I don't need your money. I don't care about that. I care about the kingdom. I care about the kingdom being established in people's hearts. I care about the king. We know through Abraham that God won't destroy the righteous with the wicked. Even before the flood, we see back when, during Noah's time, God raptured one person out. He raptured Enoch, who he loved. And then a week later, the flood came after Enoch was raptured and taken away. Then Methuselah, who was the oldest man to have ever lived, he died on the day of the flood, if you trace it back mathematically. God saved Noah through the flood. So I do believe that one day we're going to be raptured. And if you want to debate that, you can go talk to somebody about it. But I've done a lot of studying on it. But why don't people apprehend it? Because faith is the foundation. It's the substance of the things that we're hoping for. The things not seen. The conviction of things not seen is what it says there. The conviction of it. The subject of experience that the heart is convicted by things that are not seen. The invisible. God instills in us the faith. We believe in the invisible. We believe in heaven and hell. We believe in angels and demons. We believe in Jesus Christ. That he came to our rescue to save us. We believe that there's another realm that's more real than this one and that this realm or this world, it says in Romans 8, we just read that, it's passing away and that that realm of heaven, the one that we're going to, will abide forever by faith. Faith is relative to the functions of the future and the invisible. It's so difficult to explain to someone who does not know Christ, which I'm going to try to do it scientifically or later on, because God instills the testimony in our hearts, and they can't understand that. They can't understand faith, because it's the conviction of things not seen. An atheist can't see because they rationalize. They use their mind to try to figure God out. But God is omniscient, he's omnipotent, he knows everything, and he cannot be figured out with the mind. It takes a personal experience, relationally with the Creator, to understand him. His spirit, it says in 1 John chapter 3, and the word is interesting, the word says it's like a sperm to an egg. So... When, it, when creation is born, when it's born and when it happens, when that happens, the sperm comes to the egg. Well, you guys know that. You probably got, got a birds and the bees talk with your parents when you were a kid. So, But it's the same spiritually. When our dead spirit inside of us, 
when Jesus comes through his Holy Spirit, he makes us alive. The outward, this thing here, is perishing, and the inward man is growing. And we see that by faith. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8 says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him, and you're filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. If I told you, and I'm just going to use an example here, let's think here. If I told you the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man was coming to town to destroy it, would you get scared and call the Ghostbusters? I mean, like, is that something that you would do? I mean, some of you on here don't even believe in Jesus, and Jesus is real. You know, it says in the Word, that's why I'm suffering as I am. Yet, this is for no cause for shame, because I know whom I believed. You know, I know whom I believed in, you know, so, I mean, that's important to understand. But do, would you believe if I called and said the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man's coming? No. Why? Because the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man, the Ghostbusters, they're made up, though it was a fun movie. The only person in town to believe that, if I were to say that, would probably be five years old, and they saw the Ghostbusters movie. So if they still have that, marsh that uh, mindset, but I don't fear Marshmallow Man, I don't fear Godzilla, I don't fear Rodan, I don't fear King Kong, because they're not real. But I do have a healthy fear and respect and reverence towards God because he is real. And the most beautiful thing about that is that the Bible says in John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but they'll have everlasting life. And that's not when you die and go to heaven. It's the second you get saved, eternal life, once you proclaim Jesus as Lord, is implanted within us. And faith is implanted in us. And it's hard to explain. It's the foundation of our hope. It's the conviction of our hearts of things not yet seen. And it says in verse 2 that this is what the ancients were commended for because it's the sphere of faith. This is saying in the language that the ancients obtained, and the word's passive there, they did not receive the faith on their own power, but it was given to them. The things they did not, they did in faith were reported of in this chapter, if you read down, and I'm not going to read it today, but you can read further in that. So praise God. So, and in verse 3 says, By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. I do like stories about baby Jesus, though. Oh, cool. So like in, uh, what's that movie called? Uh, Talladega Nights, you like the baby Jesus, you pray to the baby Jesus. <laughs> yeah, but that's cool. I'm glad you like the stories of the baby Jesus. That's a good thing. So, all right. But every generation lived and died in the Old Testament, not receiving the fulfillment of the promises yet. Not just faith in faith, it's faith in Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, your faith was based upon, I believe, in God, and I believe that there's a Messiah to come. Then Jesus came, he died and rose again. Now it's, I believe and proclaim Jesus as Lord. So our faith is in him and what he said. We believe in him. We believe in Jesus, that he can save us, that he can get us to heaven. And we sing this song in church. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to take that which I've committed unto him against that day. And it says that in 2 Timothy chapter 1, uh, in uh, it's uh, verse 12 here, it says, That is why I'm suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame, because I know whom I have believed it. Yet this is no cause for shame, because I know whom I believe it, and am convinced that he's able to guard what I've entrusted to him, until that day. By this faith, we understand the worlds were made through God. By faith, we understand, in the Greek here, it's a word nowhere in the New Testament except here in Hebrews, it is a special word, we perceive something. 
The things appeared around us are things that do not appear. We don't just believe in life after death or some dimensional place. We believe and our central faith is in resurrection. Our families who believed in Christ will one day get up again. Our loved ones will one day have new bodies and we will physically one day wrap our arms around them again. That we will receive new bodies. To put it this way, when believers die, and I've seen many of them die, I have sat at the bedsides of many people when they've taken their last breath and shared with them about Revelation. The last couple chapters of Revelation talk about how Jesus, um, how Jesus established heaven, what heaven's going to look like, it's pretty amazing, and what they were going to experience. But we don't believe just in life after death or some dimensional place. Our central faith is in the resurrection. And I'm going to use it from a science perspective real quick. So when believers die, the software left the hardware. And if, you're, uh, if you understand computers, software is non-material. Uh, it doesn't weigh anything. It's vast. It's limitless. And you take all the software and load it into a new computer from the old one. And it's a rough sketch of what will happen to us. It's sort of like what will take place when we die. Except the hardware, the body, will be much more amazing than this one that we have right now. Because we're going to get an upgrade, praise God. Everything will work faster. It'll work more amazingly. Though it's the same software, but it's going to be different hardware. The soul in us won't change. You know, people believe that we die when we really don't die. You know, this, this thing that the same... It's made up of the same 17 elements biologically that make up dirt. This body thing here. And inside it says in Matthew 16, 26, it says that the soul is more important than anything else than the whole universe that Jesus loves the soul more important than anything else and the soul is what runs us is what the, it's the software this is just the hardware here this is just the computer or I like to call it the spacesuit personally that we're walking around the spacesuit but this thing one day will die and it goes into the cemetery or wherever you want to put it but the word cemetery means sleeping place a place the body just goes into the ground the reason called the sleeping place is that one day we get resurrected and we get new bodies. Praise be to God. That's what they called it that. Um, but resurrection is not a problem to God. You know, if I fall in the water one day and get eaten by sharks, or if I get incinerated, or if I get cremated, or my body parts are given for organ donation, or they just deteriorate in a box, they're not issues to God. The thing we should understand is atoms are fungible, which I'm going to get a little scientific for a minute because I get people on here all the time. Every week I get atheists on here and say, science, you know, Christians don't like science. Christians don't believe in science. You know, Christian, that science doesn't point to the Bible and all this other stuff. So I wanted to get a little scientific this week. So, And we do not believe in reincarnation, Migmeister, though. Um, that's a different type of faith. That's Hinduism. Um, that is Scientology. They believe in reincarnation. That's why they still celebrate L. Ron Hubbard's birthday, because of the fact that they believe that somewhere in the world he's reincarnated. Um, I'm talking about resurrection, not reincarnation. Uh, but we should understand atoms are fungible, which means they can be replaced by another identical item. Um, they're mutually interchangeable. Uh, the soul or the software determines who we are. The dirt suit, this thing here, um, the program and information determines who we are and we can be created by any atoms anywhere. The atoms determine the molecules and the molecules make the protein and God can use any old atoms to make us again into, basically into better hardware. So, but we're discovering through science more and more that the universe is constructed by things not seen, which we just read that verse earlier, which is what the Bible said in these verses before we even understood it. God spoke. Now, what does evolution teach? Evolution, if you go back and you study it, evolution teaches that matter plus energy equals life. That's what it teaches. Matter plus energy equals life. 
Well, then creationists are coming in and saying, well, no, matter plus energy cannot equal life. It doesn't make any sense because, you, you know, there's many things in the world that are inanimate that are made up of matter and energy. So there has to be something else. And what's that something else? Matter plus energy, close, not time. Matter plus energy plus information equals life. And where does the information come from? If you break down DNA, it's made up of information. So matter plus information, plus platter plus energy plus information equals life. That's the creationist view. The evolutionary view says matter plus energy equals life. So um, God spoke information and things were created. Things unseen became things seen. The programmer, God, programmed software that amassed everything together. Just read the first couple chapters of Genesis chapter 1. Because we're mostly what? Space. And Adam, blown, hold on here, let's see here, sloth, gluttony, Oh, somebody's talking about the seven deadly sins on here. So interesting. So, all right. So if you study science, we're mostly made up of space. An atom, if you took one atom and you blow it up to the size of a basketball, if I was in Philadelphia right now, the closest electron that was floating around it would be in California. It'd be about 3,000 miles away. If you took the 8,000 mile circumference of the Earth as a sphere, and took the space out of it, you could fit it into the solid mass of a basket. Everything around us, including us, is mostly space. And this solid way that we're made is made up by things that do not appear. We're mostly space, though I can go and I can touch somebody. And I won't go through them, even though they're made up of space though I should go through them. Scientists can't tell us why that is, why that's happening, which if you read Colossians chapter 1, you can tell what it is. Colossians 1, chapter uh, 1, verses 16 on. 1904 to 1906, scientists began looking at subatomic structure. They began discovering the atom, its nucleus, electrons, and protons, and floating around them, and they were staggered by this when they first when they first started studying it. And a leading quantum physicist named Ludwig Boltzmann, when the field was growing, he actually committed suicide, sadly, by hanging himself in 1906, mainly because he couldn't handle what he was discovering. Here's what he found out. He found out that the material that he was looking at was really made out of non-material. And if what he was discovering was true, then that has to, there has to be a designer. And he couldn't handle the fact that there was a designer. Now, also in 1906, J.J. Thompson received the Nobel Prize for proving electrons are particles. Then in 1937, his son was awarded the Nobel Prize for proving electrons were waves. Now, they've discovered both, and the father and son were correct on those things. What makes that more astonishing is there's compelling evidence that the only time quanta ever manifests as particles is when someone is looking at them. Danish physicist, his name is Niels Bohr, found out that if subatomic particles only come into existence when you look at them, then it's meaningless to speak of a particle's properties and characteristics as existing before that they are, observed, that they are observed, observed. But if the act of observation actually helped create the properties, what did that imply about future science? He said anyone who's shocked by quantum physics hasn't understood it. You know, so, and I'm sorry to be so scientific, but there's so many people on here who are coming on here and saying that science and Christianity don't point to the Bible. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about that. Um, one physicist who was deeply troubled by Bohr's assertion was Albert Einstein. He played a big role in quantum theory, but he chose to steer clear of quantum physics. The problem, according to Einstein's theory of relativity, is that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. Einstein, 
and his colleagues were convinced no reasonable definition of reality would permit a faster thing than light. What they discovered, though, was if they took an electron or a, or a photon, they split them off and they shot in a direction, just like, you know, being shot off in the other direction. If they deflected the piece off a plate, where they deflected it, the other piece would travel in the opposite direction but the same trajectory, even though there wasn't a plate. So they discovered, and I'm, you know, follow along with me on this. They discovered that there's some communication information between them and that they don't understand. And if one of them is traveling at the speed of light in one direction, the other is traveling at the speed of light in the other direction, then something is happening at twice the speed of light. Einstein didn't want to face that because he couldn't understand it which is what atheists do today. They can't face God because they don't understand God. They can't understand God. They try to rationalize. They try to figure it out. Mockers try to figure out why and, and try to figure out all these things, but they can't figure it out, so then they don't want to face it. One day we're going to stand before the Lord, and you know it says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So, Boris stayed unperturbed by Einstein's argument, one factor that contributed to Bohr's following was that quantum physics had been so spectacularly successful that they could do these things, just not explain why these things were taking place. So in predicting phenomena, a few physicists were willing to even consider the possibility that it may be faulty in some ways. The entire industries today of lasers, uh, microelectronics, computers, they've all emerged on the reliability of predictions of quantum physics. So uh, Richard Freeman, who is a popular Caltech physicist, he said this, uh, I think it's safe to say that no one understands quantum mechanics. He stated that of all the theories proposed in this century, the silliest is quantum theory. Some say that the only thing the query has going for it, in fact, that it's unquestionably correct. There seems to be evidence to suggest that our world and everything in it are only ghostly images. Projections from some level of reality beyond our own. Hmm, beyond our own. But the real reality is literally beyond both space and time. You know, the main architect of this astonishing idea includes one of the most eminent thinkers, the University of London physicist David Bohm, as a prestigious, and he's as prestigious as Einstein, pretty much. And one of the most respected quantum physicists in this day, Bohm's work in plasma physics in the 1950s is considered a landmark in science. One of Bohm's most startling suggestions is that the tangible reality of our everyday lives is really kind of illusion. It's like a holographic image. So, underlying it is a deeper order of existence. A vast and more primary level of reality that gives birth to all the objects and appearances of our physical world. In much the same way that a piece of holographic film gives birth to a hologram. The holographic is still a developing concept. It's riddled with controversy, but for decades, science has chosen to ignore the evidences that do not fit the standard theories. However, the volume of evidence has now reached the point that denial is no longer an option. The Bible, of course, is unique that it always presented the universe in more than three dimensions. If you read the Bible, it says that the universe is more than three dimensions and revealed that a creator is transcendent over his creation. It's the only book that demonstrates these contemporary insights. No other book does that, at least no, and in no book this old. Paul Davies reported as summarizing this provocatively. He said, as if the entire universe is nothing more than a thought in the mind of God. Let me read verse 3 again here. 
It says here in verse 3, By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. So, as I've described the universe through science, uh, through quantum physics, let me ask you a question. Who's crazy now? The truth is everything around us, this counter, those cabinets behind me, this whole, ch this whole house itself, and all of us are just space. We're just an electronic field, and quantum physicists can't stand that. We're all made out of the same atomic structure, but it's all space. And the realization that two realities can exist in the same space, and for one reality to exist, hmm, let me think here, someone had to design it and put it all in order. Hmm, which we have to believe this by faith. So, people will always tell me science pulls us away from the Bible, that, you know, Christians steer clear of science because of the fact they're, that they're afraid it's going to question, their, it's going to stop their faith or stop believing in faith, when, when actually science points to the Bible. Quantum physics points to the Bible. Quantum physics points to a creator. You know, but the thing is, is that people don't want to recognize that. So, I just told you how, Rob. I just talked about that. If you want to learn more about that, you can check out my YouTube channel. Because I'm going to be, I basically just explained the whole thing. So, sorry you tuned in late, but, you know, I went through the whole, you know, talked about quantum physics, talked about everything. So, you know, you can always, uh, quantum mechanics doesn't point to any gods. Well, like I said, I just talked to everybody about that and showed people how quantum mechanics points to God. And how even scientists, and we talked about a scientist in 1906 who committed suicide because of the fact he couldn't he couldn't grasp the fact that everything pointed to a creator. So, yeah, if you believe that there's many gods, then that's, you know, that's what you want to believe. But we believe that Jesus is the only way. He's the only truth and the only life. But the point is, is that science in, you know, I've studied science, I've studied quantum physics, it points to a creator. It points to Jesus. And it's awesome. Science doesn't pull me away from God. It points me to God. It points me to a creator. So, in my case, why only one? Because of the fact that the Bible says it. Uh, Gabriel Lopez um, says in John chapter 14, verse 6, that Jesus said, I am the only way, the only truth, the only life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. The Greek in that is singular emphatic, so Jesus is the one that said that. So here's the thing, is that if you have a problem with that, you don't have a problem with me. You have a problem with Jesus. So either you can discuss that with him and talk to him about it now through prayer, or one day when you stand before him, when you think that you're going to probably argue with him, but instead you're probably going to bow a knee and say, and the Bible says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And the only thing you'll say is Jesus is Lord. So. Okay. No, I don't adhere to mixed fabrics because of the fact that I live under the new covenant. I love people who like to refer to the old covenant. Do you have any tattoos? Do you eat pork? Do you do things? Well, you have to look at the book of Acts. And you have to see that those things are under the Old Covenant. So the, the Bible is a spiritual book. But in the Old Testament, the law and the physical part of the law and everything pointed to a spiritual place that's going to take place one day. So, so there'll be no free will when Christ returns. Boy, you guys are just, you know, 
But let me go back to what I was talking about earlier about debating. Because I'll, I'll close with that today. Because of the fact that, you know, some of you came on here late. Like I said, you can, um, you know, you can... You can watch it on YouTube and you can see my science part here. So here's the thing. In order to believe what I'm talking about today, there's something called faith, which we're talking about. You have to stand in faith in order to do that. So most of you on here who comment and don't believe in Christ don't stand in faith. You know, because I see it on the comments weekly on TikTok. They, you know, people come up with hundreds of arguments about why Christianity is just a fairy tale. And then they come on here and they want to debate and come on my live about it. They want to come on live and debate it when they don't know something. And I talked about this. I said, I spent years debating with Christians and with non-Christians alike. And I believe debating with true believers, and that's Christian to Christian, is idiotic. And I'm not talking about progressive Christians that don't know Jesus. Because they need, sometimes we need to share Christ with them. And progressive pastors will have a special place in judgment if they don't repent and stop leading people astray. But what I'm talking about first is true believers who want to have $25 word debates. Calvinism versus Arminianism, the rapture, are we going to be pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, or none, eschatology and preterist thinking, you know, other debates that they want to have. I've spent over 25 years studying the Word of God. The primary doctrine of Jesus does not change. So any denomination can agree on the primary doctrine of Christ unless it's a progressive denomination. You know, but they want to argue over the isms. And I'm not going to argue over the isms anymore because it's silly. And when Christians debate and argue, it separates us, which is not what the members of the body need. But when there are those people on live here that walk in darkness, see, you want to debate about light. You want to debate about things that are of light when you're walking and you can't see and you're walking in blindness. So, because people who don't know Jesus can come up with, like I said, a hundred arguments in their mind about why God isn't real. Then they come on my live and they troll other people's lives trying to get their debates and arguments in about why they hope they can sway other people. And usually the people they sway, which the interesting part is Christians who are walking in faith can't be swayed. So usually they're just swaying people who are also walking in darkness. And I gave this scripture, John chapter 3, verses 19 through 21. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that they may have done what has already been done in the sight of God. And the word there in what says people love darkness, people who are walking in darkness love darkness. Um, the word, there's different words in the Greek for love. There's phileo love where we get Philadelphia from. That's a brotherly love. There's storge love. There's, phil, there's um, what's it called? Uh, not phileo, phileo love. There's, um, there's different types of love. Um, for some reason, the Greek isn't coming to me right now. It's all Greek to me. <laughs> but agape is the greatest love, and it's used to describe God. He is agape love. But here it says people who are lost, people who don't know Jesus, agape darkness, it says there. That they love it with all their hearts. They want darkness. They want to go on and talk about darkness. They want to share their darkness with other people. They want to mock people for believing in the light and following the light. They want darkness. They enjoy it. And I gave a disclaimer and I said, I love that dark people who are walking in darkness come on my live. I want you on here because I want to share light with you. I want the word to shine in you. 
because I wanted to cut through you like it says that the word is alive and active and sharper than any double-edged sword. And that's the thing is that in order to understand what I'm talking about today, you need to have faith. Because people who are walking in darkness can have a hundred arguments about is Jesus magical enough to make you slim on here? Eros love, that's what I was thinking of. Thank you, Thomas Michael, I appreciate that. So they say Jesus is a myth. Look, there it is, Jesus is a myth. Faith is feelings, not truth. You know, see, so that's the thing is that you're walking in darkness. You don't understand. And you'll have a hundred arguments without, but without faith, you have nothing. You know, which a lot of times people are walking in darkness. They want to debate. And there are plenty of pastors on here who will do that. I watched one the other day. I was watching Jason on here the other day and he was debating. And I love, I love the fact he's doing that. That's not what I do anymore. I don't debate people anymore. So when people want to come on here on their live and debate, I don't want to do that anymore because I don't believe that debate is going to change your heart. Prayer is stronger than any debate. Me going to my Lord and praying for people like St. John Ward, if he doesn't believe, Palestinian Jew, if he doesn't believe, the people I'm reading on here. If I go to the Lord and I pray for you, which I pray for you daily pretty much, ever since I've been coming on here and I've been getting mocked by atheists and mocked by mockers, I pray for you because I don't want you to walk in darkness anymore. I want you to see the light. And I believe prayer is stronger than any debate. And I believe that when we do Bible study on here and you hear the word of God, it goes in. And I pray that it's going to make a seed inside of you, that it's going to grow, and eventually you're going to get saved and you're going to proclaim Jesus as Lord. You know, that's why when people say to me, what is your opinion? Oh, what's your opinion about certain cultural subjects on here? Let me talk about this. What's your opinion on that? You know, why do you care what I think? Personally. There's a bunch of people on here that don't care what I think. They just come on here because they want to debate or they want to mock or they want to say something, which is fine. Like I said, come to my Bible study every week. If you want to mock me, come on here. If you want to call me fat, which people were doing earlier, I'm confident in who I am in Jesus. I'm confident in the kingdom. I like, I walk, I walk and work out every day. I walk for an hour. I lift. I I work at I work here at a ranch. I'm on I'm on my ranch and I do things on my ranch and I stand confident in who I am in Jesus Christ and I'm very very happy. And when I leave here, I have a beautiful wife, I have a beautiful property here in Texas, and when you come on here and call me simple-minded, unintelligent, fat, whatever you want to call me, I let it go. It's gone. It's gone and I go back to my to my life. But I pray for you. That's the cool part. I pray for you. I love you too, Thomas Michael. So I love you in Christ, brother. So, but when they say to me, oh, pastor, what's your, what's your opinion on homosexuality? Or what's your opinion on this? Or what's your opinion on Donald Trump or politics or whatever? What do you care what I think? Personally. Because I tell you what the Bible says. I'm going to do that. Whenever I had people in my office and I was giving them counseling, marriage counseling, whatever it is, I didn't give my opinion. I told them what the Word of God says. And I showed them what the Word of God says. Because it doesn't matter what I think. It matters what the Lord says, what Jesus says. But the problem is, is that the people who are on here are walking in darkness. And I'm going to pray for you to have light this week. They need faith. They need Jesus because atheists won't believe in this. Mockers do not have it and people can't see because that scripture says they agape darkness. So I'm glad you're here so that God's word can destroy those strongholds in your life and in your hearts and that Jesus can finally shine some light there. Praise God. But that's where that's you asked me my opinion on that so I gave it to you so 
Praise be to God. Thank you, Lord. So uh, I do thank you for tuning in today. Like I said, I apologize for giving you so much science and quantum physics and all those things. I'm sure some of you tuned out during that, but um, you know, I get so many people on here every week that say that science and the Bible, you know, I believe science points to the Bible. I believe there wouldn't be science without God. There would be, there wouldn't be things that we can say. And if you think about it, really, there wouldn't be, there wouldn't be, um, you know, we wouldn't be able to study anything if there wasn't God, you know, and I, and here's the thing I want you to, to think, if you're an atheist, if you're someone who's a scientist, um, please stop looking to space and look through a microscope. Look at the body. Look at how we're one trillion cells. Look at the amazing things that, you know, look at the atom itself, which we talked about earlier. That, you know, this couldn't, you know, our atoms couldn't be held together. There are positive and electrons, there's positives and negative charges floating around each other when they should connect. Negatives should push apart, you know, all these things, but yet they're all held together. And Colossians chapter 1 says that Jesus holds it together and that we're mostly space. So, oh, a no offense taken, Black Rose, um... I am not a Trump supporting white supremacist. Um, I did minister to white supremacists when I was on South Street, but no, um, in my faith, uh, in the Bible, uh, racism is something that we don't we don't follow. Actually, um, this is something I talked about last week or the week before. Is that we need to stop looking at this and start looking at what's inside. We need to start looking at the soul of each and every individual. You know, what this is doesn't make up who I am. It doesn't make up what other people are. Our souls do. So praise be to God. So it doesn't matter if God's black or white or whatever. It doesn't matter because of the fact that Jesus loves us. And we shouldn't look at things carnally. We are not carnal people. We are supposed to be colorblind like, this, like Bob Smith said. You know, we love people, we love this, what's inside of them. You know, Matthew 16, 26, I referred to earlier, it says, what if I were to gain the whole world, yet forfeit my soul? And what, and the word there, the world there is actually the word cosmos. It says the whole universe, Jesus is saying there, because Jesus is the one who said it. The whole universe, everything in it is fails in comparison, fails in importance to the soul that's inside of you. And we need to look to the soul and we look, look to the beauty of that. And if we did that, there would be no racism. If we saw people the way Christ did, there would be no racism. There would be no gender confusion. There would be nothing. It would be souls. And I care about people. I don't care if you're non-binary. I care about your soul. I don't care if you're gender fluid, I care about your soul. I don't care if you're gay, I care about your soul. I don't care if you're black, I care about your soul. I care about people's souls because that's how I see people. I see people from the inside, not the outside. And if we started doing that from a spiritual perspective and not from a carnal perspective, then things would be more beautiful in this world. Which you probably could do that even if you're not a Christian. You could start looking at someone's heart instead of the color of their skin. So, praise be to God. Uh, but thank you for tuning in today. Let me just check out some of the comments before I go, see if anything is going on here. Let's see. doesn't matter if, my, if I think your soul's going to hell or not. I told you earlier, it's not about me, it's about Jesus. So... All right. If you don't, like I said, look at reading. I'm not going to go through the whole scientific part of this again, because then I'll be on here another 20 minutes and I do have to get back to work. So, OK, the Bible is not outdated, but 46 authors, 66 books written over thousands of years, over three continents, 
And while someone was writing it from this time period in this continent, somebody else was writing the same thing. While two people were on different parts, hundreds of miles apart, they were writing the same exact thing, and they put the Bible together. So, let's see here. You have free will when Christ, do you have free will when Christ returns? Well, no, if, it doesn't matter about free will. It marries if you know Jesus or if you don't know Jesus when Christ returns. I care because you're human. Yeah, that's good too. I mean, that's a wonderful thing as well. And thank you for, um, yeah, thank you for that St. John Stewart. John Wart, I appreciate that. I appreciate all your questions today. I see there's a lot of good ones on here. All right, cool. Thank you, LaToya. And, and, you know, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Thomas Michael, for um, giving me the Agape Eros, Storge, and Phileo. I appreciate that. You know, because I was, like, trying to remember what it was. Eros Love. Okay. Trump is the Antichrist. We talked about the Antichrist about, um, probably about a month and a half ago. So, Spike, if you want to check that out, it's on my YouTube channel. We talked about if Trump's the Antichrist or not. Um, as well as if uh, Hillary Clinton is, Obama, and all those people. So, all right, well, let me see. All right, praise God. All right, well, thank you all so much for coming on today. I do. I love you guys. I love your families. Uh, I'll be praying for you this week. And like I said, mockers, atheists, you are welcome to join us for a Bible study every Wednesday. Uh, Christians, thank you for coming on today. I'm glad we could go through Hebrews chapter 1 a little bit today and talk about that. And I uh, hope you all have a blessed day. Oh, let me pray for you first. Lord, I, I lift up each and every person on here. Who, uh, Lord, I pray that you uh, would build the Christians on here, that you would build their faith. You help them to be bold Christians. You would help them to um, come to be stronger in you, Father God, that when people come against them, Lord, that you would give them the right words to say through your Holy Spirit. Uh, it says in your word that when people do come against us, that you would give us the right words to say through that, Lord. So thank you for that. I pray, Lord, that you would continue to bless them and their families, continue to move them forward. They are, you're Yahweh Jireh. So, Lord, I pray that whatever illnesses, whatever things they might be facing today, Lord, I pray that you would be over their sicknesses. I pray by your authority and by your blood that you would touch them, Lord, and their families, that you would be over them. And, Father, for those who don't know you on here, Lord, I pray again for them. I ask, Father, that you would move in their hearts, that you would move in their lives. Father, that you would help them proclaim you as Lord and Savior by any means necessary, that you would help them, just like you did with me, Lord, uh, me, with me losing sleep and with me all those things taking place to where I just couldn't ignore you, Lord. I pray, Father, that you would do that for them, uh, that they would see and know, and that you would make them, you would turn them from Saul's into Paul's. Would you do that for me, Lord? Would you turn them into Paul's? Lord, knock them off their horses. Give them a Damascus experience, Father. And Lord, thank you, Father, for this opportunity to come and to be able to talk about you and to talk about your love for us. We love you. I love you, Jesus. I thank you, Father, for the opportunity to talk about you and to share your love with others. And we give you all the praise. We give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Praise God. Thank you so much uh, for coming in today. I, I love you guys. Hope you have a beautiful rest of your week. And I'll be back next week for Bible study again. So uh, God bless y'all.